Hey guys, what's going on? Just a quick note before we get started. I'm still here. I'm still doing the show. We've been working on things in the background. Life has been a little crazy. I'm moving the studio out of my basement and into an actual space. And I'm going to tear down this edit station this week. So things are just a little hectic, but we've got some excellent guests coming up for you. So be sure to stay tuned in the coming weeks. Now, onto the show. Today's guest is Mateos Bastos, better known as Matt. Matt's based in the New York City area, and he's really killing it in the narrative space. He's got some amazing projects coming out soon, plus a, a great resume of projects already under his belt. We talk about his journey from musician to full-time filmmaker, which feels very familiar to me, considering that was my path as well. And uh, we just have a good time and a good conversation. Matt's a great guy. We've been kind of kicking it back and forth on Instagram for a while, but this is the first time we've had a chance to sit down and uh, chat, albeit virtually. So so without any delay, here's Matt. I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right. So, so like, let's, let's start fresh again now that we did our like yeah. little, little housekeeping, but like, you know, yeah. like I asked, how's, how's life? Tell me what life is like and, and what your year's been like or how your year's going. Yeah. So the year started off good, man. You know, it was, I think a lot of us went into 2023 thinking like, this is going to be the year. Oh and, yes. Oh yes. Yeah. And, and you know, it, for a lot of people, it's been it's been okay. For some others, you know, for many others, it's been great. And but in in a way, I think there's hopefully a lot of like reform happening within you know with through our strikes and with SAG after and the WGA, and hopefully like that brings on a new wave of like just sort of like healthier working conditions and better better benefits for everyone involved. You know, I, I had a couple of films at different festivals. I worked on. Story I have with Eric Bronco. I did additional photography and took over main unit for him. And that was really special to see a film that we worked on sort of at a major festival like South by. I had another short film called The Gag, which was a like a sort of satire musical comedy about, funny enough, daytime talk show writers and sort of like the the realities and the abuse they go through. Yeah. And that went to Tribeca, which is really great. And the rest of the year has kind of just been like focusing on finishing up my two features in color. Um, I had a feature called Gazer, which is a um, a real big passion project of mine with uh, my uh, director, Ryan J. Sloan. We worked on that and that's just, oh, we just wrapped up post and we're off to our first special submission next week. And then another feature I worked on called Wild Ed and Wicked and those were coloring at the same time. So we were able just to kind of like take advantage of the slowdown and just devote my time to staring at a screen for yeah. hours just like coloring the movie and finishing that so i would say in a way like it's been a slow year for making money but a good year for getting things done which i appreciate yeah so i mean you just seem to be doing quite a bit do you feel like do you feel that momentum building lately like in the in the recent past yeah it's interesting man because there there's like there's i look at momentum kind of as two things there's like the sort of visible momentum and then there's like the internalized internal sort of like behind the scenes behind baseball momentum right yeah. and because you know at i think it was either september or october of last year i was out in la i had a really great year of just kind of like wrapping up a feature like i said working on that movie with eric bronco and sort of soon after found myself sort of having agent meetings and meeting with agents and ended up signing with my agency apa and after that, it felt like there's a lot of like visible outward momentum of like, this is happening, projects are coming in, things are talking, but really the, a lot of the momentum and the growth has been like some more of the internal stuff of like, okay, cool. Like all these features that I've been working on that's in the pipeline, they're finally coming to fruition. I, you know, I worked on three different films all at the same time and they're all coming out out of order. And so it's just interesting. It's like this back and forth of like, yeah, I'm busy, but then I'm sitting down, I'm just like filling out emails and making sure like we're getting our stuff done on time. And it's like, this is also busy, but it's not the outward busy. And so I, I feel it. And then there are days where I wake up and I'm like, what's, what's happening today? I'm not doing anything or nothing's on the horizon, but that's sort of the life of a filmmaker, right? Yeah. Not knowing what's next. Do you, do you feel like, and I ask this because my answer yeah. to this question is, is yes, totally. But do you yeah. feel like you're your own worst enemy half the time? hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. And it ends up being like, you know, you, whether it's, you know, the, the, the old game of like seeing how busy other people are or seeing what like your peers and your colleagues are working on. And, and you're so inspired by them and you're like, wow, this so, so-and-so is doing a great job or this person's doing 
some really great work. But I always think of that story where Tarantino was talking about how he was working on, I think it was in Glorious Bastards, and then There Will Be Blood had just come out. And he saw what Paul Thomas Anderson did with There Will Be Blood and just like, just thought immediately, okay, I got to get my game up. Like, because whatever he just did, and they're friends, they've been longtime friends. And there's like that beautiful kind of thing of, I feel like I'm able to look at my sort of my colleagues and my peers and be like, nice, like they're doing beautiful things. But also when other people are busy and you're kind of just like scrolling on Instagram, it's like, I'd like to be busy. But I feel like the biggest thing we can do as artists is just sort of like not attach self-worth to how busy we are or how, you know, how, how, we, how busy we appear to be. I struggle with that all the time. And, you know, you're like, take this dynamic, for example, like this conversation mm-hmm. we're mm-hmm. having. You know, I'm a good clip older than you. You're a young guy. You got plenty of time and you're already building like this really right. great career as a DP. And mm-hmm. I'm sitting on this side of the table. I'm do, I do work. Like, I get jobs. It's mm-hmm. all good. Mm-hmm. But I think I, you know, my ambition is to, is to work in more narrative, do more features, kind of yeah. do the things that, that you're doing. And I think if I didn't have the dynamic with you that yeah. we've built just, just online, just messaging back and forth and like having like totally. cool little conversations here and there, I think maybe I would, I would have more of that, like, and the envy for lack of a better sure, term, sure. Inst- yeah, instead yeah, yeah. of just like the whole concept of a rising tide, Mm-hmm. raises all ships you know it's like you want to see the people Absolutely. you know that your friends with do better but it's still every every day man it's a struggle depending on the day it's a struggle mm-hmm. you know but so one thing i'm interested about is i've you know in my research i've listened to you know a couple of interviews you did i know you did carlo's <laughs> podcast the yeah. creative gap and and that was a really great interview and yeah. i know you've kind of recounted the story about when you were starting and you shot mm-hmm. like your first i don't even know if it was a feature it was like maybe even a short and you didn't know short, it, and yeah. you didn't know what you were doing and you just kind of like threw a light somewhere because you needed to light something and it just happened to work out and you're like oh yeah oh wow that's amazing how mm-hmm. you're like how does it evolve from here and this all leads to the question of like what's your strategy for learning and when i say mm-hmm. strategy for learning i don't necessarily mean you've sat down and actually thought about it but it's like if i have to put you on the spot and say like how do you learn yeah. or how how do you effectively like take new things in and right. process that what does that what does that look like for you if we call it strategy for learning it, it's it's funny because i had a very interesting relationship with education for a long time like i was never a good student growing up i I was like the, the high school student that went to summer school every year for math because I was just never good at it. And and then when I even when I got to college, I, I didn't start excelling until I got into the things that I wanted to do, which was like more filmmaking kind of stuff. And and so I again, this, this idea of learning I always had a weird relationship with it because I felt like there's environments that are great for fostering learning, right? And it's the traditional schools, workshops, mentorship programs, all these really great things. And then there's sort of like people who are a bit more of self-starters who can just pick up a copy of the ASC magazine, go to YouTube film school, right? And start kind of learning things. And for me, I, I've i always been kind of a blend of the two. I've always appreciated sort of the learning environment of school, but I never felt like I learned in a classroom, but I learned sort of being around peers. And, and on the flip side of that, I'm someone who, I feel like I have a very active mind when I'm watching things. like. For example, there are some folks talking about like the new Oppenheimer film, right? And how they notice a couple of things. Some shots are out of focus or there's like, you can see the key light and reflections of their glasses. And and I notice those things, but when I notice them, I like they don't pull me out of the movie. It just adds a layer on top for me of like, okay, this is what sort of the filmmaking is. And I feel like I've always had that kind of mind growing up. And so I found myself growing up kind of always watching things. And then soon after, podcasts, interviews, ASC article magazines, and then, of course, just the the process of learning by doing. You know, I, I came up a little bit in camera department and a little bit in lighting kind of coming up and always was shooting in the meantime. But it was just a series of like, shoot something. Why doesn't it look like what I want it to look like? Try again. And that was sort of the beautiful thing about, I think, what film school offers or even just like the early on in people's career is like the sort of the safety of failure. And I think that a lot of people are afraid of failure for, for many reasons. Cause you know, as we become, we become more and more visible, there is like, 
this pressure of like people have expectations of you or they know who you are, your career, but like the antithesis of creativity is this like no failure mindset, you know? And so I feel like, you know, I like to learn by like trying and failing and what you might see the end result isn't failure, but it might've lit something. And I was like, Ooh, I lit that wrong. And you just relight it or you try something again, or there were moments on set where we'll shoot something and we're kind of like about to move on. And this is early on in my career. It's like something we're about to move on. I'll just go back to the director and I'm like, I think we got to go back and just get those last two shots one more time. Or like, we go back to the wide real quick because whatever we just experienced in the last like little bit of coverage, recontextualize what the wide meant for me now. And I need to go back and make it better. And, you know, sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. But I feel like the, there's a presence that comes to learning. And I think it's it comes from curiosity and it comes from like the willingness to like be wrong, you know, and that's a, it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes to admit that like, Ooh, didn't do that well. Well, and let's try again. Yeah. To me, it sounds like to summarize, it seems like all the traditional things that go into learning, like curiosity and experimentation, yeah. but also the willingness to self edit for lack of a better mm-hmm. term to, mm-hmm. to be a little self-critical not in like a, not in a deprecating way, but just in, in the way of like, okay, yeah. is this really working? Like listening to your gut, doing a self uh-huh. edit on the fly and saying like, you know, is this something I can change or am I just being neurotic and like have to leave stuff? Cause I do stuff like that all the 100%. time where it's like, I, you know, I think it's just kind of in our nature as creatives and being in the cinematographer's seat where it's like, yeah. you kind of want to be a perfectionist all the time or just always yeah. tweak, always tweak. And at some, t- at some point you just have to let it go and say, this is good enough <laughs> or listen to somebody else and say, no, 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 this is, this is it. Yeah. You're, you're fine. Exactly. But, but not being exactly. afraid to, you know, listen to that internal voice yeah. that's, that's telling you that, you know, maybe you can do it better. I think exactly what you're hitting yeah. on right there. It's that, that phrase of like not being afraid, you know, there's this this is really beautiful. I, I guess it's like a tribute piece or an interview or like, the, it's very like cinematic kind of thing of it's featuring Emmanuel Lubezki. I think it was for a cinematography magazine or an arts collective. They kind of feature artists every month. And this was a few years ago now, right when like Birdman and the Revenant were kind of like really hot. Mm-hmm. And they were interviewing other filmmakers talking about Emmanuel Lubezki and just sort of his boldness and his like, his boundary pushing of how he captures things. And Someone in the, in like the, 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 the tribute piece said, what we're seeing, and I'm paraphrasing, but they said, what we're seeing in Chivo's work right now is a artist who is no longer afraid. Hmm. And there's something about that that just kind of clicked me. And once I heard that and I reminded myself of it recently, I'm seeing it in the work of all these master filmmakers who are now sort of in like, you know, maybe like the, the the latter half of their career, right? They're on the second half, they kind of hit new strides and they're less precious and they're less technical and they're allowing for flaws. And I see that and a lot of people are like, oh, they got lazy or whatever. And I'm like, well, these are some of the best, the best. Truly, I think they're just no longer afraid. Yeah, they are. They are at their most confident. And that means like being OK with our flaws as human beings and really leaning into them. And I, I started adapting this mentality lately. I heard my, my buddy Ryan say this of like, whenever we watch a movie together and we watch it, he's like, oh, it was flawed, but I liked its flaws. And I just adopted that. I'm like, yeah, it's it's sort of it's part of the whole thing. And so I think that comes with, I, I didn't want to say a lack of fear, but I think it's accepting the fear. So does and that- that's when you can really grow out of your, your like, I don't know, I, I think that's when you reach like, like, like being boundaryless or the, the, the pursuit of being boundaryless. So does being less afraid, clearly this is something you've adopted. How has, Man. how has that impacted you now? Mm. Yeah, I, I think I'm willing to take more risks. You know, I think I'm willing to put the lens in a different place. I think I'm willing to crank my ISO up 2000 and not worry about the noise, or I'm willing to like flip the key sometimes, if, you know what I mean? Cause it's, there's something about like, I, I feel like every decision we make on set has to come from a, uh, a clear-minded place of presence, but also like an appreciation and a knowledge of the the text, which is the script, but also like the moment, you know, like what does the moment say? And I think that being open to all of that and then trying to be, I don't want to say fear again, or accepting the fear, accepting that things are a little bit scary or unknown. You can then be like, well, what happens if I break the eye line? 
and that may or may not work. And, you know, sort of education has taught us like, no, no, you stay on this side of the line. And that's for a reason, right? It works in the editing. It works in sort of the spatial geography of a scene. But then it's like, well, what happens if I just do that? And you flip it. And, you know, oftentimes you might find something really interesting on the other side of that. And if you don't, you can just hop right back over it. And I feel like allow yourself to do that. And so I, I found myself just allowing myself to try to be more open to things and be more open to pushing things a little more, pushing the envelope in a way that, you know, I would have been definitely afraid of ever going past 800 ISO. And now on this thing that I just did with my buddy Oren that we could compete together, we went to 3,200. We we're like, we don't care. If we had more, we go more. Like it's, it's part of it now. And I think that's sort of like, you know, and that was an in the moment decision that felt right. And so I, I think that's where sort of like the pursuit of being okay with fear is all of a sudden looks like the lack of fear, but it's really, you're just being okay with it. I think that's what we're trying to get as artists. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think fear is probably the most important part of, of being an artist. Yeah. If I wasn't afraid of how my life would turn, it would have turned out if I didn't take a more active role, I never would have picked up a camera. Right. Right. And that's led me on a whole journey. And, you yeah. know, I'm still, every time I step on set, especially with people I've <laughs> never worked with before, it doesn't matter the job, if it's big or small, uh -huh. I'm afraid to some, yeah. to some degree, the first time I ever like shot interviews with like big name talent, that's, yeah. that's freaky. And then you get through it and yeah. you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's like a feather in your cap and you feel a little more confident and it doesn't mean uh -huh. That you stop working to improve your craft or yourself, but it's just, you know, it keeps it keeps you going, it keeps you on your toes, keeps you honest. Yeah, you know exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, all we have to do is just like, as filmmakers, we're constantly adapting. I think it's adapting to situations, but it's also adapting to like new versions of yourself or how you see the world or how you see art. And, and I think that's being in tune with everything around you, but also what's inside of you. And that's a that's a constant recycling, right? It's a constant like rechecking in and being like right i'm here i'm here i'm here and, and i think that's sort of like the the cross we carry as artists having to do that totally now that you're in you know well ingrained in your in your career as a dp and, uh -huh. and still moving forward it's, uh -huh. it's a pretty saturated market yeah in terms of so many people are shooting and so many people are cinematographers and and things uh -huh. like that what do you think your unfair advantage is what what oh, what what makes people call Matt Bastos instead of the next that's, person? That's a great question. My unfair advantage, and it's funny because because I I I will I will answer that question, but I also say one thing I try to remind people and myself of all the time, which goes back to the whole thing we talked about earlier. I'm just sort of like always looking online and having thoughts and these self sort of deprecating feelings of our. Artistry is, I always I have this phrase that I always say and remind people, it's others pe other people's advantages are not my disadvantage. Yeah. And something I, and that's sort of like the positive outlook on it, of just like, right, that person may come from this wealthy background, that person may have a filmmaker family, that person may have this, but that's what they got, and all I can do is have what I got. And that's something that I always try to think of. That being said, my unfair advantage, I think it might be my, you know, it, it, it might be my age a little bit, like... You know, I I started making films and shooting as a cinematographer around the age of 20. Yeah. And at the age of 20 or 21, like I went and I shot a film, a short film in Ireland with some friends. I was gearing up to make like bigger projects and I had music videos that were kind of starting to pop off. And, and I remember sort of like feeling this unfair advantage of like, oh, I got started early. And and I, I took that, I ran with it. And, you know, there's a lot of people who start a little bit later in life, that's totally fine. I think Harris Savides was one of my heroes. They didn't make his first film until he was like 35 or 40. He was a fashion photographer for a long time. He was doing other things. But I look at that and I'm like, you know, there's people who get in at that point. And now we also have, you know, I think the DP of that film, Bones and All, Arseni Kachaturin, I think his name is. He worked on The Idol and some other films. Mm -hmm. He was 27 when he made Bones and All, I believe. And Luca Guadagnino just found his film at a festival that he was on the jury for. And was recommended him and thought this was a great choice. And so you see all that. It's like, oh, right. They're, they're all over the spectrum of age. But yeah. I do think there is something about, um, at least for me, I, I felt like people saw me as like very impressive for my age. And at the time, I just felt like I was just stumbling, trying to figure out what the hell I was doing. 
And I sort of ran with that. I was like, okay, I'm the young guy. I'll take it. And that came with its own challenges, right? There's a lot of people who will dismiss you immediately because of sort of, you know, unfortunately what you look like or how old you are, where you come from. But I sort of like was able to get right through that. And I was just like, all right, I'm just going to be me. And if, if the work speaks to people and they're not thrown off about the age thing, then thumbs up, man, I'll take it, you know? And again, that was a few years ago. Now I'm coming into, I'm 27, turning 28 in a few months. And that was like, okay, I had that time. And now I feel like I'm a little more in the way of everyone else. And that, that's probably my unfair advantage that I had. Yeah, man, I, I, it's a good answer because it gives you a lot of yeah. runway. It gives you a lot of time to improve. Granted, yeah. everybody's, you know, everybody's path is different. I didn't touch a camera till I was 30. Like, wow. Like touch a camera till I was 30. So what did you do before? What were you into? Oh, I was, I was all in on music, which we're definitely going to talk about. Cause Same. I know you were in yeah. a band for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's just so funny how people go from music to film all the time, all the time. It's like the most seamless transition all the time, mostly because yeah. they wind up in my boat, which was get some work and then burn through all the mm-hmm. money you made just living yep. and then not having other work. And you know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a common tale, but yeah. I, I feel like it's probably a good, a good time to like kind of bring up the band. So, you yep. know, you were in my research here, you were in, okay. a, in, oh, an, gosh. in an emo band called Sistine. E- yes. Yes. I was, I was the drummer of an emo, emo alternative band called Sistine. We were very inspired by sort of like new wave revival emo stuff. I would say bands like Thrice, Sunny Day Real Estate, Manchester Orchestra. That was kind of our our vibe. And I did that. It's been almost 10 years now. And in many ways, I'm still best friends with all those guys. Everyone's off kind of doing their own thing. One of them, his name is Brian. He's a composer now living in LA. And we still work together sometimes. And so it's cool to kind of still have that connection. But that was a big part of my life for a long time. And that's when like the blend between film and music was a little unclear or at least the transition. And then at a certain moment, it became very clear music was down and film was up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear, you know, because I did stumble on the old Matt Bastos Tumblr page. Um, Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You went deep, man. Oh, I went deep. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's clear you had like a knack for, for visuals, even just like, the tour, yeah. the tour photos or the band photos you were mm-hmm. taking, um, yeah. y- you definitely had that that inspiration and that you know, kind of that voice early on. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's interesting you say that at, at some point there was like there was like this shift because it seemed from the little bit I was able to garner that you kind of yeah. took up you know the director mantle for you know shooting a music video for your band or. Mm-hmm. Or what? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And how yeah, did yeah. how did that how did that feel at the moment where you're like, oh, okay, maybe maybe this isn't for me. Maybe music isn't my thing. Maybe I'm yeah. maybe I'm a visual storyteller. How did that feel? Because I yeah. I remember just kind of having this this sort of come to Jesus moment, you know, for lack of a better uh-huh. term, on my end. Uh-huh. And and I'm just curious what that experience is like for you. <laughs> Man, you know, at the time it, it was, it was heartbreaking. You know, like I, I had been in, I didn't go to a proper film school for my undergrad. I, later I went off to grad school, but I never in my undergrad sort of, I was always in a band and I was shooting music videos on the side and kind of making a little bit of cash there and had like a part-time job working, doing like a website management and tech inventory for a school. And, and on the side of that was like this band and we would go on tour and travel and write music. And for a long time, it was like, this is it. This is the thing I'm going to do. And then once film became more and more like prominent in my life, it was like, okay, let's see how long this can last, you know? And the, the way it sort of music kind of fizzled out was, you know, I, we had written a full length album and I, I recorded it on drums. We tracked it. And then I went off to grad school. I was like, all right, guys, I'm moving away. I'm going to school. When I'm back for Christmas break or whatever, spring break or anything, we'll just like keep working on the album. And then the band kind of fizzled, you know what I mean? Like I, I kind of left and they just sort of went off and did their own thing. And so when I came back, it was, it it was like, it was like coming home to like something that wasn't there anymore. Yeah. And I was, and it was, again, in in a way it was heartbreaking, but then I was like, okay, I'm just all in on this other thing now. And a lot of the people that I had my early sort of successes with in film, my, my dear friends, you know, Kelsey and Rich were two people in the music scene who found their way into film. 
we did all of our early music videos together. So in a way, like it all kind of fed into the next thing, even just, I mean, you know, from, from being in music, just like the long drives and carrying heavy equipment and being away from home and putting yourself out there and this like community aspect, it's, it, it transferred so beautifully, but there was this kind of like, it felt like it was a hole for a little bit of like, it, okay, there's this music filled hole and it's, it's gone or this music sized hole and it's gone now. And it wasn't, it honestly wasn't until the, the night that I got signed to my agency, me and my old bandmates, we all happened to be in LA and we got together. We rented a, a room at like midnight to 2 a.m. We just jammed. We just jammed for like two, three hours, played old songs, played new stuff. And then we closed it out. And that to me felt like, boom, books closed. That was, I'm good. I'm good. And I'm off to, and it's funny, that took a few years to find that full closure. And, but it was, it was tough at first, man. But now I look back at it with a lot of fondness and we found some old demos and we were all hanging out the other night, getting dinner and just listening to them. And it was, it was, it was funny to remember like that version of myself, or at least that, that part of myself that. It's sort of like still alive and still lingers and one day wants to burst back out. But I can still I can look back at it with like appreciation for what it was. That, you know? That's cool. You know, I think I don't I don't know if I've ever like had to like verbalize this. So we'll we'll yeah. see how it goes. But I yeah. think part of the reason people, you know, pursue things like playing in a band and, you know, making music and going on tour and like all this Being stuff nerd. is is because it's like it's very romantic or romanticized and it yeah it's almost like this pursuit of of something that isn't just like playing guitar or playing drums it's like mm-hmm. searching for a different kind of expression you know what i mean yeah and, and i think that's what it was for me is like i was always searching for something playing in a band yeah and i thought i would get it and then when you have that moment of realization where it's like oh that's not actually yeah, yeah, yeah. what's in the cards for me it, it is this weird dichotomy of like feeling feeling empty and sad but then also feeling optimistic at like something else you've discovered and that happens in different ways for everybody but you know it's 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 interesting because i could see it evolve like i could see the yeah. evolution in your work even even then on the tumblr i'm gonna put yeah. you i'm gonna put you on the spot for a second here oh my god i Oh, yeah. I have no idea what's on there, so I'm, I'm nervous. Uh, you know, the whole point of bringing this up is is not to like yeah. is not to be silly. It's it's to say of that course. it's like, you know, as the person you know interviewing you, getting you on the show, and like trying to tell mm-hmm. a little bit of your story. It's like I can see the through lines of like yeah. how you're thinking and and where your creative process is going, and and what makes you a really good filmmaker and a good collaborator. Sure. Because sure. here's here's something from <clears throat> from the Tumblr. Okay, is it is there a date on it? Is there a date? I th- I didn't write down the date, but I think it was seven okay, or eight, no seven or eight years ago. So it was a while. Wow. Okay. Cool. The editing process for what keeps us together is almost complete. Getting closer yeah. and closer to the final product, and I've never been so proud yet cynical of something before. I feel like both my own biggest fan and critic. It sucks, but I know that every creative feels the same. Yeah. And that that rung true with me because yeah. I think that's something, you know, even as a, as a younger guy, you had yeah. a very clear and very realistic outlook yeah. on because that yeah. doesn't, that doesn't change. I mean, whether you're 18, 18 or 28 or 38 or whatever. Yeah. I feel that. And I'm certainly not the only one who, you know, you make something that you get very excited about. You're like, oh my God, I'm actually Mm -hmm. getting to craft something. And then you're also simultaneously like, well, what if it sucks? Does it suck? Oh Uh my God, I can't do this. Like, you know, you start to criticize yourself before it's even out in the world. Yeah. But just at the end saying that, you know, you know, every creative feels the same. is like just kind of internalizing the fact that, you know, you're acknowledging that this is part of the process. And I'm curious how do you handle that now? Right. That was you, mm. that was you eight years ago. Has that yeah. feeling changed for you? Has it gone away? Does it still exist? If it still exists, like how do you, mm. how do you handle that? Especially now considering in the, in the filmmaking game, you're really starting to, you know, work with bigger jobs, bigger mm-hmm. talent, things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's so funny. Cause as you read that, what popped in my mind was two things. One was 
if only he knew. <laughs> if only he knew what what the next eight years is going to look like. But also, I thought like, oh, eight years later, uh, eight or nine years later, and the feelings kind of still the same. You know, I think there's a more evolved version of it. There's a more matured version of it. I think then, I mean, God, I was probably just saying it because I cause it sounded super interesting and thoughtful, and I heard people say it, but and I knew what the creatives, but that was something that I knew was a thing. And I would say now, being where I'm at, having sort of the the friends I've made and the connections I've made along the way and people that I can, you know, I, I, I would say like a, a group of people that I find myself like being able to go to with these feelings and talk about, because I think back then I couldn't, I had no one to tell. I, I told Tumblr, you know, I, I sure. put it in a post. I was like, I got to just say things. The way I handle it now is truly knowing that like, one, I'm not alone, but two, it's, it's, it's a cycle of like, you make stuff and you think it's amazing and then you think it's bad and then you think it's okay and then it's out and it's amazing and then months go by, you think it's bad. And, and as you sort of start to recognize these patterns, like uh, for example, I just received a cut from the rough cut from this film I did called The Morning Of out in Dallas, Texas that I was very, very happy with. And I did some like temp looks on it and I graded some looks on it. I love working on the monitor. It felt super great. We got the first cut back. And they slapped on a whatever LUD on there. And this happens every single time. I watch the first cut and I get so incredibly depressed. And I'm like, I messed it all up. It's, I, I'm awful. I'm done. Like, I cannot believe I shot it like that. And then I step away for a few days. And I come back and I'm like, wait, no. If I got the grade, my temporary grade to look like this, it's going to look fine. And it's this kind of thing of like, I, I, and I, this is probably the first time where I recognize that pattern of like, yeah, every time I see a first cut of something, I'm immediately depressed. Not even about the cut itself. I know directors have a whole other thing with assemblies, but I look at like my work on it. I'm like, I botched this whole thing. And then I get over it. So now that I can sort of, I've grown and I can look back at my career and recognize my patterns, I like remind myself much quicker of like, no, no, it's the right path. You're doing the right thing. You follow what was right. It's just this project in its form is not quite it yet. And it will be it. Or I even just catch myself like in the middle of feeling down. I'm like, ah, well, you know, so and so. And I just talked about this last week. It's fine. And I just, I, I feel like I quickly get over it now. Whereas then maybe it lingered a lot more and it, I took it a lot more to heart when I was younger. This week's show sponsor is Cine Kitlist. Cine Kitlist is an online community for video production pros that provides its members with exclusive access to discounts on pro video equipment you won't find anywhere else. Cine Kitlist also offers something no one else in the industry does, exclusive cart quotes for any purchase. Build your cart on Adorama's website, send it to the Cine Kitlist team, and they'll quote you exclusive pricing on everything in the cart. Get access to high-end B2B pricing just like a large rental house or studio would, and the service is 100% free. Come join the vibrant community of video professionals to get access to this deal and many more by searching at CineKitlist on Facebook and Instagram. CineKitlist, putting the best on sets for less. Yeah, I guess it's all about how you find your your own form of therapy, right? Totally. You know? Totally. And I mean, this this show's mine. Like it's, it's been great to, to yeah. really iron out some wrinkles for me and build rapport with new people and, you know, stay in touch with folks. And it's, it's been really great to, to feel yeah. less alone in that regard, because, you know, at the end of the day, I like know. I said earlier, I'm my own worst enemy. I get in my head way too much about yeah. stuff. And, yeah. you know, if I can get into a group setting and just talk to other people who are in the same boat as me, it's, it's yeah. really aligning and it, and it makes you feel a lot less alone. So like, so now what's your, what's your support system? Like, like when you're feeling, when you're feeling like that, who are those folks that you're, that you're chatting to? I have, I have like three central filmmaking group chats that are just like near and dear friends. And, and some of them like inter, intertwine with each other. Some of them don't even know each other, but they're all, a lot of them are like actually LA based folk. Yeah. And they're just like really near and dear friends, you know, like my, my buddies, obviously Oren, Soffer, Max Major, Kurt, Pat. A Shahabian, and then I have other friends like Jacob McKee and Kyle Rose and Jake Coletta, and then and my oh, oh the Cam and Marigold, Elliot Lee, and yeah, Gabriel Rougeau. They're all just like all these three different group chats, and we can we we both have it as like safe places to talk about work or complain about work or people we worked with, or but also like to share things we're excited about. Like we have kind of this rule, this unspoken rule of like 
You don't ask to share stills. You just send them and we're going to talk about them. And then I have like my more like local folks, like I mentioned Ryan Sloan and Ariella Mastriani, Jordan, Jordan the Saint, and all these really near and dear friends who like, you know, they're all like within 20 minutes from me. And whenever we're just like bored or down and want to catch a movie, it's like, hey, let's meet up and we just pop on over and, and spend time with each other. And and that's sort of what the support system looks like, man. It's I, I feel blessed that I have friends who are over on the West Coast. And then folks who are like 20 minutes from me and uh, even friends in New York, like my friend Iris or my friend Rhea and all these people that we can just like spend time together. And it's, I value that a lot, especially in the recent sort of two years, just, you know, getting reminders from like just life events that like our time is so limited. Mm-hmm. Like I, I remember it's a, it's a bit of a side tangent, but I remember my, my, my stepfather before he passed away last year, he had this sort of thing where whenever we went out to dinner, you would just like, you wouldn't worry about the bill. You just spend whatever and you just buy whatever for whoever is there and you pay for others. And because he was like, every time you eat, it's a celebration. You're celebrating life, you're celebrating each other and you make sure everyone's included. And I try to apply that to not just eating, but spending time with people or like, I like if, if I'm having three friends over, I'm like, hey, you all bring three friends. Like, let's make it a thing. Let's celebrate because yeah, man, you just never know when, when the next thing is. Yeah. So the, the, I, I feel blessed that I have those folks who, you know, you can call at any time of the day or talk to, or we're just going to spend time with you. That's cool, and, man. And those, that, that's the real stuff. And then especially when they intersect with work, like when those friends happen to be filmmakers and some of them are, and some of them are, and they just relate to you on that level. Like that's the good stuff. I, I love the work that we do and the work is great. And the work is arguably like what lasts, you know, our careers. But the thing that matters when we're alive is the people, you know, yeah. and the memories we make. That's the beautiful stuff. That's really great, dude. Yeah. So, so now I'm just going to start sending you stills. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever. Perfect. I'll take it, man. Great. But, you know, that brings me to like the next thing. And and this is just more of like me projecting my stuff that I think a lot of mm-hmm. other. And so for me, especially starting late and like se- being a self-taught filmmaker and not going to a film school or having like a lot of connections, like mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff kind of outside looking mm-hmm. in. So to me, like being a DP oftentimes feels like a cool kids game, right? Sure. Um, sure. And so, so kind of spinning off of this, it's like, how have you find found like an organic feel good way of making connections with other yeah. folks, right? Because I uh-huh. like, I'll just use myself as an example. Sure. I never vibe with like networking for the sake of networking. I hate it. It doesn't feel authentic, uh-huh. but you know, you've, you've made some connections that have, you know, not only led to friendships, but led to some, some boosts in the career. I, like you said, Oren and, and your crew out in LA, mm-hmm. I know I'll see you post, you go like mini golfing or whatever when you're, when you're yeah, out there yeah, exactly. and it's, and it's cool. And that's developed to like this place where those are like authentic, real friendships, which yeah. everybody should aspire to. But it's like, how are you fostering those relationships? Like, uh, you know, if, if an 18 year old filmmaker was sitting next to me here and they were like desperate to know, like, how do I even just start like crafting these authentic connections? Uh, how would you go about it? Or how have you done it? I, I, when I was younger, I definitely felt a lot of this pressure of like, I got to connect with people. I got to find people. How do I do this? How do I put myself out there? And I think what I landed on kind of early on was like a balance of being genuine, being human and being someone who like wanted to be a part of a community. And whether that's cinematography salon or an in-person meeting or something, just sort of like being active, right? Supporting, commenting, if I see something that I think is really beautiful, if someone did an excellent job on, I'm going to let them know. And and that I feel like is an aspect of the community building. I'm just like lifting everyone up. And so I think that was a big thing for me. Like what I sure. post is just work. But my story is like all my personality. Like you'll see everything else about me. I'm very mindful of like, well, you know, I, I'm, yes, I'm a cinematographer, but I'm also, I'm, I'm a musician. I'm a, I'm an uncle. I'm a brother. I'm a son. It, it's, it's part of that whole like being careful to tread that line of like not making our identity just what we do, which is hard because what we do is so tied to how we see the world and how we see the world is who we are. And so it kind of feels like a cycle, but yeah. there's a separation of like, no, no, I'm a human being and I'm interested in other things like everyone else. I find that very easily, not easily, but very smoothly, the things start to feel like, oh, the network grows. 
And two, one other beautiful thing is sort of like the friends of friends thing, right? And the internet ends up being sort of like a, I know who you are, <laughs> sort yeah, of. Totally. And then and then you hang out with them and it's like, oh, we should hang out all the time. I The one group chat I have with a lot of my LA friends was started because we were planning a Disney trip because I've never been to Disney. And, and that grew out of like, one person was like, we got to take Matt to Disney. Our buddy likes Disney. This guy's never been. Let's all come in. And all of a sudden we're, we're a group of friends. And so, but I would say the flip side of that, and I'll summarize it quickly, is like, I also try to let the work speak for itself too. You know, I think when I was younger, I felt a lot of pressure of calling myself a cinematographer, right? I, in my bio or any website stuff, I had the filmmaker because I was kind of directing. I liked to screenwrite. I was shooting stuff and I never felt like I fit into one thing just yet. And I was like, all I can do is let the work speak. And I would just put work out there and I would share some process about the work, how I lit it, what I kind of went for, what I inspired by. And then from there, as I became more confident in who I was, I allowed myself to be my like who I am. And then people were like, oh, cool. I like what you do and what you say. And I like you. Boom, we're in. So I think I think it, it come, I think a lot of that to summarize it all, a lot of that outward sort of connection with people really starts inside first and knowing who you are and knowing what you want. And truly question, asking yourself, like, what is it that I want from people? Do I want an advantage or do I want friendship and connection? And, you know, whatever people choose, that's up to them. But I felt like I wanted the connection and that served me well. Yeah, man, that's a really great answer. And I and that's really in line with where I've landed. I feel like I've lived a lot of mm-hmm. lives. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my <laughs> my Achilles heel that I've kind of dragged with me my whole life is I feel like I'm always just kind of behind the eight ball all the time, Mm -hmm. like kind Mm -hmm. of a late bloomer for all these like self-realizations. Like, uh, you know, the best way to grow a network or connections or whatever in the place you want to, you want to be in is to not try and grow your network or connections and just, you know, give up a piece of yourself and put it Mm -hmm. out there. And, you know, it's the whole, like, if you build it, they will come mentality. So going back to, you know, the current status of, of Mm -hmm. your career, I feel like you've hit kind of a new tier in your career for whatever, whatever that's worth. You, you came in and subbed, subbed for Eric Bronco on story F. Um, Mm -hmm. I think if I remember correctly hearing somewhere else that that was really a big lever for getting you signed to your agent. Definitely. Yeah. And then I know you just a little while back, pushed out a Demi Lovato video that you shot that I had no idea you shot, but being in this position, right? Yeah. All this new stuff coming your way, hitting a new tier in your career. What do you feel like you've mastered? Or if you don't like the term Um, mastered, like what do you feel like you have locked down pretty well? And where do you think you're still learning? Mm, That's a great question. I feel like what I have down pretty well is communication with a team. I think I have that pretty good. Like I feel like I've really stepped into a strong position of leadership at, in the last few years where I feel like I, I can I, I, I can lead a team into battle. And it's still a growing thing because, you know, what does leadership look like when there's a union involved? What does leadership look like when there's showrunners and executive producers on a TV show? Like, what is that? And those are things that I haven't quite touched yet, but and, and the indie sense and, you know, kind of non big studio stuff, I've been really comfortable just kind of like stepping into this role. And that was something I had to do on Story Ave, right? Sort of like showing up and be like, hey, everyone, I'm the DP now and I'm finishing this out and stepping into those shoes. And, you know, they always come with a little bit of like your first couple of hours, you're like doing kind of baby steps. And then something happens where you got to make the you gotta make a decision quickly and you just step into that role. I think another thing too is sort of, accomplishing a vision on set and making sure it comes through in post. I'm very into the color process and I'm thinking about color while I'm shooting. And that's something I sort of has built over the last couple of years. And I think it, it was a benefit sort of coming from a more simplistic approach where like, you know, we, I, I didn't grow up having much. And so I was able to do a lot with a little on my, on my film gazer, the 16 millimeter feature that we have coming out hopefully soon and off to festivals. We, our brightest unit was a 600D yeah, and our smallest were some quasars. And we had to light a whole feature on film with like a four or five light package of small LEDs. And that was something that I felt like 
I, I became confident in simplicity and became confident in the idea of like, you don't need a lot to do a lot. And so that's something I feel really good about. Stuff where I feel like I'm still sort of working on is, I just heard a friend on a podcast recently, and he talked about sort of working with techno cranes recently in his first time. And, and I so related to the idea of just like, when the hell am I going to ask for a techno crane? I don't know. Like, I, I don't know what they cost. I don't know what, like, when I would use one. I feel like I would immediately be like, oh, well, let's just do it on the ground handheld or something. You know, I've just in the last like year and a half have been comfortable, like, and comfortable, like saying like, we need, we need a Fisher dolly on this because, you know, in my mind, I'm like, that's an expense that I'm cost the production. And I would come from a very, very indie world. And now I'm working with producers who are like, no, no, do, do you want the techno? Like, tell us. Or do you want the Fisher 11, 10, or 12? Like, give us what you want. Or you, you can get two sets of lenses, like, if, if, you, if you need them. And I'm now kind of like, I think that's where I have a lot of growth to still go, is like, give myself the permission to be bigger than I have been. And I think that's both out of, like, a fear of, like, oh, I don't quite know what these things are, and I don't want to ask for them and make a fool of myself. And I'm now kind of, like, reached that point where I'm like, well, I'm going to ask for it because that's what the shop needs. I'm not going to... I'm not going to fold on the vision just for the sake of something else. And if the budget says no, then it says no, we, we pivot. But I'm now allowing myself to be comfortable to ask for what I want. It's so it's so funny because it's really not that big of a deal sometimes, especially when you hit a production where they're like, you can you can get what you want. Just tell us. And you say, okay, sorry, I'm going to ask for it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely working on that still. I'm, I'm 100% aligned with what you just said. Because I feel like our backgrounds are pretty similar. I, I came from yeah. and still work all the time in super small, scrappy crews because I have this this one producer, my buddy, Matt, who I work with a bunch. Okay. And our running joke is that I always I, I, I've never worked with a techno crane before. I'm like, come on, yeah. man. Like, you know, because I'll yeah. give because he's been on a million big jobs with with technos. And I'm like, when are we going to do yeah. our techno job? And I was I was DP for this like live concert yeah. last last year. Yeah, And we were going to do a techno for Mm. like a crane, like over the crowd shot, but it wouldn't fit through the loading bay in the building. Like there was some kind Uh, of weird piping thing and then we couldn't do it. I was, it was like, I was so close to having my moment. Well, cool dude. And, and, you know, kind of still in the, in the realm of filmmaking before we wrap up with some like rapid fire, more like Mm -hmm. esoteric stuff. Yeah. You seem to be laser focused on narrative work, at least from what I've seen. And so, so my question, and this is actually a me question that hopefully serves, yeah, yeah. serves a bigger audience. Cause I'm like a commercial do- like, yeah, right. and, and some studio work, but a lot of like doc style, commercial branded stuff, sure. like that kind of thing. Yeah. I want to focus more on narrative, right? Yeah. So what do I do? What do I do? Mm, if yeah. I, if I've shot like two shorts and that's about it and I want to be, yeah, yeah you know, lensing some of the kind of thing, things that you're doing, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And then by effect, what does somebody who's looking to, yeah, 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 exactly. So it's a good question. A, a lot of people have asked me like any advice for more narrative stuff. And I think that there's like, so filmmaking is so broad, right? Like totally. the industry is so broad. There's commercials, there's corporate, there's music videos, there's, you know, even levels of commercials, there's indie narrative, studio narrative. And I think a lot, like and I'll sort of divide them up into Music videos, narrative, and commercials. Let's just say those are like kind of the yeah. broad three. Music videos and commercials have a little bit of like bleed, bleed through. Music videos and narrative have a little bit of bleed through. Commercial and narrative has almost none. And it's very interesting. It's a very interesting kind of thing where people kind of like come up in music videos and they can easily find themselves bouncing to one or the other. People come up in commercials, can easily go to the other. People come up, there are people who come up in, you know, just straight get into union narrative stuff and that's all they ever do and so i think for me when once i recognize that i recognize that that means that there are different people in each kind of world and each of those worlds have their own sort of for lack of a better word their look right their kind of style their tone the things they value the things they put out there even the way they present things right and this is no shade to anyone you see a music video dp who sort of does let's say just really great music videos like really like like you know top 100 stuff and they are even presenting things in a different way than the air than the nindy sorry the, the indie narrative VP would. And that's fine. That's just sort of like a, a product of the culture, a product of the environment around you and sort of like what you almost have to sell yourself on to be there. 
So all that being said, once I recognized that, I that made me realize that there are a I mean, just just think of every like just think of like a I don't know, New Jersey, LA, and uh, any other cool market like Texas or Florida or New Mexico. Like, and then think about just in those like three to four states, how many film festivals happen every year? Oh, yeah. And how many films get into those festivals? And that kind of clicked with me that there is a lot of people making projects out there. And those people who are in the indie narrative world aren't probably are not making their bread and butter off commercial or music video work. Maybe they have side jobs, they have something else. And so for me, it, I, I just wanted to be really in tune with sort of who's doing what in the, in the indie narrative world. And I think that means both like working on short films and I've done a lot of short films that came out really great and a lot that did not come out great. And some that never even came out and just being involved with those people because they're, they're probably working on other narrative stuff. And so I, I always try to just like keep my eyes out on who's doing interesting things and and that includes, you know, looking at who got into what festival. Like every time Sundance announces their like their fellowship labs or Project Involved does their film independent stuff or shorts to feature lab or something, I'm always just trying to like keep my eyes out on who's working on what project. Same with the Indeed Rising Voices project, which is one of the the ones I did that went to Tribeca. Just sort of like looking at those filmmakers, and because even if even if they're first time filmmakers or it's their fifth short film or they made features before or I there, there's no chance I'll work with them or there's a chance you just keep your eyes on them and you see sort of what they're up to and kind of invest yourself into their growth and their career and then you start noticing like ah they worked with this producer that I got I got a coffee with last night and then everything just kind of starts to come together so all that being said I feel I feel like knowing is kind of half the battle knowing who does what and then it truly does just come down to like you do a short and you put it out there and you repeat and then I feel like early on, I really put myself out there as like, I am the narrative guy. And a lot of that was kind of also like subconscious. Like I just, I got into film because I like movies and that's all kind of like, that's all I do know. You know, I know way more about how a film set runs than like how to deal with like an agency with like advertisements. Like, you know, if you just put me in a room with like a client with agency, I'm just like, I don't know what to talk to you about. <laughs> you put me in a room with a, with a grip and a couple PAs, we can, we can hit it off fine. That's where I come from. So I think just always kind of doing things and always trying to put out shorts and even making your own shorts and just putting them out, putting them out, getting into festivals and then showing up to these places is huge. That's why festivals will like value filmmakers who I think for a lot of festivals, when you're submitting, they say like, are you expected to come? And yeah. if you say yes, they're, they're, they, you know, that's not an immediate yes, but they'll take that towards the yes lever. Does, like, doesn't hurt cool. your cause. Doesn't hurt you. Of cause. course not. Yeah. Of course not. And you know, so many times you just pop in somewhere and meet someone. And I, I, I bet so many friends that I am now like pretty good friends with that live in LA or New York, right here in my backyard, that I met at a festival in Utah or I met at a festival in wherever. And it's like, right, everyone comes to these things. And so I, I feel like you almost have to like kind of push yourself in through the doorway of like, I'm here and I do narrative and I want to know what everyone else is doing in narrative. And also this understanding that narrative just takes forever, yeah. right? The well, Daniel Kwan of, of the Daniels duo said something at, during his Oscar speech of like, the internet moves at the rate of milliseconds while films move at the rate of years. And there's something really interesting about that of like, right, we can't confuse this like immediate gratification thing with a process that takes years. And that's the whole thing with narrative, which is like, it takes time. And, and if there's someone who is even early on in their career, but has a great eye and a great vision, but they don't have the funding to do whatever, like stick by those people because they'll they'll find they'll find their way eventually. And even if it takes us helping them find that way, you know, it takes, you know, there, there's investments we make that's not always just financial. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. I totally, totally yeah. agree. Cool, man. Well, let's let's do some rapid fire. So what what inspires or inspired past tense or present tense your creativity? Like photo books, paintings, painters, what? Like yeah. what what outside of film? Like just leave, yeah. leave film on the table for a second. Um, totally, what totally. inspires your creativity? Mm. I would say photo books is huge. I love photo books. I started off doing a lot of photography. I haven't done much recently because it's busy, but love photo. I just love going through photo books. I love touching physical media. I'm a big, like I have a Blu-ray collection. I have a vinyl collection. I have a photo book collection. I love being able to touch something tangible and look at it. That inspires me. Museum visits, just physical arts. 
And I, I'm really inspired by a lot of, you know, the women in my life. I, I have a really incredible single mother who's fantastic and it was so strong. I have a really great older sister who's fantastic and younger sisters that I love. So I'm very inspired by the women in my life who are very resilient and very just like strong in, in their in their in their ways. And I really appreciate that. Great answers. Yeah. What what core skill do you wish you developed earlier? Discipline. <laughs> I think. Amen. I think discipline. Yeah. I, I think I, I'm a little disorganized. I'm very much, I was a procrastinator growing up. I always get things done at the 11th hour yep. and it always came out fine, but I wish I was a little more disciplined. Like I, I'm, I'm more of a night owl than an early riser. I wish I was an early riser, but it, it's the way it is. I wish I was a little more disciplined, but when it comes to the craft, I'm very disciplined, but it's just like my day to day. Like I, I wish I could have a calendar. I don't have a, like I have a calendar for like some stuff, but people time out their days by like hour blocks. I wish I could do that. It's not me. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. In terms of being an early yeah. riser, have a kid and then you'll, you know. Yeah. And then it'll change. Your yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel that I relate to that. And uh, so what keeps you happy outside of career? Spending time with, with the people I love, friends and family. That keeps me really happy. And I guess like I, I, I don't want to say exploring, like I'm like going into the woods and finding something, but I love to like see new places, new things. I love to travel. It keeps me very happy. But I would say mostly just like, I, I love nothing. I, I, I'm i not a big partier. Like I didn't grow up going to like parties or clubs or anything. I would much rather like have friends come over for dinner, sit around a dinner table and talk for five hours. Like I love that. That gives me so much energy and joy. So I think just spending time with good people is like the best thing in the world. Right on, dude. What is one huge inflection point that stands out to you? could be in life, could be in career. What's one moment that sticks in your brain as like, okay, things are going to change from this point forward. I mean, the, the cop out answer is like when I got signed, which, you know, didn't really like, I'm still the same. Everything's like not changed that much. It might've been either working on story Ave, because I had this feeling of like, I'm involved with something really special and and I knew it was special and I knew it was going to be like something that people really would gravitate towards. Either that or when I, when we finished the color grade on my feature Gazer, I just like looked at the film we shot with very little, it was a micro budget movie and shot on film. And I saw what we did with like little to no means. And I was like, got it. I was like, I, I, I did something on this and we did something on this. And I don't know if it's going to like change my career, but it's something shifted within me where I was like, I can do anything. You know what I mean? If I did this, I could do anything. And that gave me a lot of confidence to go forward and just keep shooting on film. And now I can walk into a room with very minimal light and be like, we're good. I'm fine. I think that was a big kind of turning point for me. Cool, man. All right. Okay. So here's the last one. What does legacy mean to you? And what yeah. is yours? What, what do you want yours to be? And I'm curious yeah. because I'd be curious to ask you this question 10 years from yeah. now, you know, yeah. but yeah. right now yeah. where you sit at almost 28, what does legacy mm. mean to you? And what do you want to leave behind? Mm. It's, I, 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 it's funny because when I was in the band, we, I, we used to split lyric writing duties. Like sometimes I would write lyrics, perhaps that so we didn't have like a singer. We had two guitarists that sang. And we all kind of split the lyric dude. And I actually wrote a whole song all about this idea of like legacy and what we leave behind. And so I've been thinking about this whole thing since the age of like 20. But legacy for me, I think it, it, it truly means like leaving behind a body of work that resonates and connects. And, and I say that because that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to do now actively, right? I'm, I'm actively trying to create things that connect because for me films have always been a place to escape to a hideaway to like live in a safe place to be when everything else is like all over the place and the biggest compliment i get the thing that strikes my heart the most is when people say i watched the film of yours and it made me cry or it made me feel not so alone or i watched something and it deeply moved me or your work is so provocative like all these things when i hear that it stirs up emotion i'm like okay, I'm accomplishing something, right? Like, the, like, like everything else, like, you know, I, the goal is obviously, you know, finish the movie, make a beautiful image, blah, blah, blah. But the goal is to like move people. Like that's the goal. And if I can say that I can leave behind a body of work that people watched and 
again, so much of it's out of my hands. I'm not, I'm not a writer, director, it's just the work. But if people can look at the work and say like, they resonated with the images I crafted or the frame I did said something or they can't leave their head or something. I say that that's that's legacy that I, I I would like to leave behind. And to me, legacy also means like inspiration. You know, I I look at I think at, at a very early age, I kind of not a very early, like earlier age, but a few years ago, I dealt out the idea of like I I don't want to be the flavor of the week. D, you know, DP. I think there's a lot of DPs who really blow up and they just do incredible incredible work and it, it, it's fantastic stuff. And I didn't quite feel like I felt in that category of like overnight success in a year, they blew up. I felt like I, I've been at this for, you know, quite a, quite a little bit. And I, I've been finding a lot of more public success recently, but I look at people like you know, Harris Savides, Darius Kanji, these folks who like sort of over the span of their career, they made incredible works. And at like a later age too, like Darius Kanji obviously did seven and a more and all these great films. And then for a few years, it's kind of like, Doing some other stuff, and then Uncut Gems, Okja, and you know, just the Lost City of Z, incredible filmmaker. I don't want to be the flavor of the week. I want to be the fact that I'm still talking about Harris Savides years after he passed. The years, the, the fact that Darius Kanji, after a, a long thirty plus year career, is still going. That's what I want, and that to me is legacy. This endless inspiration that lasts sort of throughout the multitude of years, and not the not the one hot thing that happened kind of went away. So I look at like longevity as legacy. If I can have a long career and my career and the work I made not only outlasts me, but keeps inspiring long after I am gone, that's all I can ask for. Spoken like a true artist, Matt. There you go. Thanks, man. Um, Thank you, bud. Well, dude, this has been great. Let's wrap it up. Where, yeah. like, where can people learn more about you online? And is there anything going on now that you're that's coming up or that's out now that you want to promote you know tell us yeah thanks man so i first of all it's been such a fun time it's been it's nice to have like genuine conversations totally. on podcasts and not that any of the ones i i've done weren't well with lovely people but you know sometimes uh, you run into a a non-recorded conversation with someone and it's like the worst thing for it. so it's nice to know that even in this like kind of setting it's been very it's been very pleasant thanks man um, i appreciate it of course man People can find me all over Instagram or the internet, or, you know, I go, I, I go professionally, I go by Mateus Bastos. Uh, so you can look up M-A-T-H-E-U-S-B-A-S-T-O-S.com. I also own Matt Bastos. So you look up my name, you'll find it. Same thing with Instagram, just at Matt underscore Bastos. That's where I just, I post my work and you'll see my, my silly, whatever else I post on my stories. And as far as what's next, man, like I said, we I have two features, Gazer that I'm super proud of and another one called Wild and Wicked that I'm also very proud of. Those are off to the festival races now. And I'm hoping in early 2024, they'll be making their moves. And otherwise, I have a short film I just did called The Morning Of that's off to help with festival races as well. And just sort of looking for whatever's next, you know, whatever the next script is and I'm open to whatever that might be. And now I'm just enjoying sort of like the calm before the storm, hopefully. Yeah. Enjoy the ride, buddy. Matt Bastos. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. All right. That was my conversation with Matt Bastos. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Really great conversation. Such such a pleasure to talk to him. He's such a nice dude. I'll be sure to put links to all of his stuff in the show notes. Maybe I'll even throw in that Tumblr link that we mentioned in the episode just to have some fun. If you want to learn more about this show, you can find us at nosetpath.com or on Instagram at nosetpathpodcast. And you can learn more about me, your host, Drew English at drewenglish.com or on Instagram at drewenglish with two H's at the end. As always, if you can subscribe or like wherever you're listening to this, or even if you're on YouTube, all that stuff really helps out the show. So if you can do me that favor, that would be super great. Uh, Until next time, take it easy. Take it easy.